Yeah, so I've come here from California where, you know, we recently had a very historic drought. It was the worst in 600 to 1200 years, depending on the tree ring study. And the opportunity with data is to find where and how to achieve uh, the most efficient uses of water. So measuring where water is used to what purposes and why, and how to find uh, how to use it more efficiently. Collect the dots before you can connect the dots. <laughs> The question of what are the facts, and it's important to get those right. Um, it's just kind of having a, a common basis to be able to communicate, and you know, so we're not talking about like apples and Martian kumquats and just going like this. Um, and it's actually very important just for like a civilized society, as you know, you see <laughs> in kind of some of the discourse these days. Um, I would say, you know, there's still obviously room for like people's values and, you know, sometimes it's not just about the data, it's about how you interpret it and in terms of how, what that means for, like, you know, people have different goals um, and you can use that uh, as a tool to achieve those goals. It's not really about the data so much as data is just a tool. It's more about the problem, I would say. And I think, um, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can get people excited. One is having kind of like, wow, like I didn't, you know, sort of statistics um, in terms of like fun fact, you know, Southern California spent almost half a billion dollars on paying people to tear out their lawns to be more water efficient with the drought. Um, to meet those regulations I was talking about. Um, the other way you can do it is you work with the people that have real needs. Um, so often your biggest people who want to get excited are the people that have been working on this for a while, whether that's in the public sector or um, in an NGO or academic researchers who struggle with a lot of these very mundane and repetitive issues to be able to actually like get the data that they need to be able to do their job. So then a lot of this fancy data science stuff is ways to remove barriers to, so that they can do their job um, better. Um, one of the things, it's, it was really cool to be in Australia. One of the things that, you know, a bunch of us when we were in grad school would like, you know, when we were kind of like daydreaming about where the, all this was going, was that kind of notion that, uh, you know, you look at in the private sector, like a lot of things like, you know, I stayed at an Airbnb, took, you know, people take like Uber and Lyft, and like a lot of those digital platforms are necessarily global. Um, and some of this data, it's still pretty early in terms of the open data movement when you really think about it, and also particularly you know, the public sector has unique challenges and opportunities, um, but there's opportunity for some kind of pretty nifty global collaborations. Um, and you're already starting to see that with, you know, we really live in kind of a golden era of like empirical policy-based research was is there's more and better data to be able to do like quantitative applied research into questions. Um, and the more that we can get sort of kind of uh, global collaborations and, you know, because the challenges that, you know, Australia has with, you know, your drought or whether it's Cape Town or Southern California, you know, like Cape Town when they were about to go to day zero, meaning like no water, <laughs> very dramatic, which is um, not quite where California or Australia has been, but, you know, they were doing a lot of uh, messaging around that and doing some randomized control trials and there's there's lessons learned that can be shared both ways. Um, and historically, that wasn't really the case. And so like some of these new digital tools make that much easier, which is kind of cool. Yeah, so I think uh, it wouldn't be like one global thing. It would be more of you have sort of, uh, to throw out a fancy phrase like polycentric, where it's like you have like little local nodes that are very specific and problem focused. Because um, like what we've been doing in California, it's really not even 
all just of California or all of California water. It's very focused on urban water use efficiency. Um, and you kind of need that because you're to be able to make that meaningful for people. Um, and I think, so you need to understand like the local circumstances so that you can have an impact, but then it's like connecting those different nodes. And I think hopefully, you know, over the coming years is there's more and more of these. I think part of it, you know, there's a, a series of technical pieces that have been, you know, that have been barriers before in terms of like a lot of the tooling to be able to share data securely and make it meaningful has really evolved. And like there's really uh, impressive open source tools that have been kind of developed in the private sector and in use and that's really come together. Uh, the other piece is that there's a growing examples of case studies where it's been successful and proven out so that you can kind of have that to kind of break through the um, inertia of the status quo. Don't waste the opportunity with a big drought because there's an, you know, there's, <laughs> it, there's, it's top of mind and if when it's in the news, it's, you know, it's in the minds of decision makers. There's a window of opportunity where people will be like, oh, let's try something new. And realistically, you know, to get, um, to get some grad students like trying some things or to get some people, you know, you get some analysts in a city or in a water district and to just kind of start um, and to do something that is relevant and then kind of iterate and build on that. Uh, you know, I think that the one piece of advice I'd say is just start soon so that rather than wait, um, rather than wait to like get all the, you know, mythically perfect pieces together. Our analysis helped our part utilities save a little over $20 million in the avoided capital costs because, you know, better understanding of water demand didn't have to build a new supplemental reservoir and they didn't realize that. And that um, another one was looking at what really motivates people to tear out um, and convert their lawns to other landscape choices like native plants that are more, uh, or other drought friendly plants that are uh, more water efficient. And that, a lot of evidence was showing that it's not just the rebate dollar amount, but also a lot of the customer education and marketing. And it helped in, um, inform the kind of regional Southern California water utility to really like triple their advertising and marketing spend to really focus in on that policy lever. Um, and then, you know, at a personal level, it's kind of one of those things when you dive really deeply into this, you can never kind of unsee things where it's like, uh, you know, the different types of, uh, whether it's plants or whether it's, you know, an appliance or um, uh, like the faucets, like, you know, in the bathroom right over there, you have the little like signage. You always just like compare like how those things are done. Um, and try to, I know I came from a family that uh, worked in water for a lot, so that was very drilled into my head. Um, uh, one of the other cool things, one of the utilities we work with has been working to get similar to, I don't know if you have this in Australia, but there's these like energy star scores that do for like energy efficient appliances. There was nothing like that for um, say plants that are more or less like drought friendly. So there's like California friendly plants and they like put stickers on there so that you, um, so it brands them. And that's kind of coming to the market um, now and being piloted, which is pretty cool.